Chapter Five of The Sword of Deborah by F. Tennyson Jesse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Five, Outposts. It is a matter of temperament whether community life, with its enforced lack of individualism, or the intense refraction engendered by the fact of two people only living together in a solitude, is the more trying. In the former state one may hope to attain isolation from the very superabundance of personalities all around, but for the latter there is at least this to be said, that if the two feel like leaving each other alone, there is no distraction of noise and presences. Either is a test to persons who are sensitive about their right to solitude, a greater one than to those who mix happily with their fellow humans. Both are to be found in their best expression among the English girls in France. From the fanny convoy to a lonely rest station was a change that set me thinking over the problem, a problem in which I was a mere observer, but which all these girls had solved each in her different way, doubtless, but as far as I could tell, to the nicest, hair-fine edge of success. My first rest station was an out-of-the-way little place, bleak and treeless, and consisted of a wooden hut built alongside the railway line. In this hut lived the two V.A.D.s, who ran the show, which means that they did the cooking for themselves and for the trains which they supplied with food, that they dispense medicines for the patients who appear daily at sick parade, and give first aid to accidents, change dressings if any cases on a hospital train need it, feed stretcher-bearers and ambulance-drivers, whose hours often prevent them getting back to billets for regular meals, take in nurses who are either arriving or leaving by a night train and would otherwise have nowhere to go, and in their spare time, if you can imagine them having any, grow their own vegetables, and make bandages, pillows, and other supplies for the troops. Just two girls, voluntary unpaid workers, who are nurses, needlewomen, doctors, chemists, gardeners, and general servants, and whose work can never be done, or, when done, has to begin at once all over again. No recreation except what they find in books and themselves, nowhere to go, and that perpetual silhouette of railway trucks, and the hard edge of station roof out of the window, of shabby houses and their own tiny yard at the back, the noise of shunting and train whistling in their ears night and day, and with it all, worst touch of the lot, to have to do their own work for themselves. To slave for others all day long, as long as you can come in and find things ready for you at night, your hot cocoa in its cup and your hot water bag, that great consolation of the women members of the BEF, in your bed, is endurable, but to come in and have no cocoa if you don't make it yourself, no bag if you don't see to it, that is a different affair, and that is where these two girls seemed to me to touch a point that of necessity the others I had seen did not. And now that women are doing men's work, it is to be supposed that they have found out the value of meals, and no longer look on an egg with one's tea as the greatest height to which nourishment need rise, and hence have honorably to set about cooking for themselves, and there is no woman but will understand the boredom of that, the rations that a paternal army insists on showering upon them. Under such circumstances to work is human, but to eat divine. As I stepped out of the car at the door, feeling terribly impertinent at this rolling round in luxury to gaze at the work of my betters, one of the V.A.D.s came to the door of the shanty to greet us. She was a fair creature, with wind-blown yellow hair, and a smut which kindly accident had placed exactly like an old-time patch upon the curve of one flushed cheek. She was wrapped in a big pinafore of butcher blue, and explained that she was cleaning up. It all looked very clean to me. Certainly the little dispensary, the room into which you first walked, was spotless, everything ranged ready for sick parade, glass, white enamel, metal, shining in the shaft of sunlight which came palely in at the open doorway. To the left was the kitchen, stone-floored, fitted with an English stove, to the right the tiny slip of sitting-room from which opened the two still narrower little bedrooms. That was all. This is the atmosphere in which the two girls live, but, as usual, they have done everything that is possible with it. Brilliant curtains, pictures, rows of books, the rest stations keep up a sort of circulating library, exchanging their books from time to time amongst themselves by way of the ambulance trains, which are thus supplied with the library also and charming pottery ranged along the shelves. The rest stations rather make a point of their pottery. It is their tradition always to drink out of bowls instead of cups, and their plates have the triumphant Gaelic cock, in bravery of prismatic plumage, striding across them. After I had said good-bye to the golden girl of the inspired smut, 
I went on to a bigger rest station, at a terminus, and was in time to lunch there. It was a more sophisticated affair than that which I had left, yet when this rest station was started, at the beginning of the war, its habitation was a railway truck, for the romance of which some of those who were there in that first rush, when you were never off your feet for twenty-four hours at a time, sometimes sigh. Now part of the station buildings has been partitioned off for them, and there is a fairly big dispensary, with a bed for dressings, and accident cases, of which quite a number are brought in, a kitchen, a little dining-room where all the furniture is home-made, deep chairs out of barrels and the like, and behind that a big storeroom, crammed from floor to ceiling with stores. The girls do not sleep here, but in billets at the town, but they have to provide meals at any hour and meet all the ambulance trains with food and extra comforts. We had a very good lunch, of stew and onions and potatoes, big bowls of steaming coffee, and a pudding with raisins, all cooked by one of the V.A.D. domestic staff, who always had to slip into her place last to eat it, and get out of it first to serve the next course. I saw only these two rest stations, each typical in its way, the one of the isolated and the other of the central kind, but they are scattered up and down the line, varying in character according to the needs of the particular place. At one, for instance, there is a small ward attached, where slight cases, not bad enough to be admitted to the hospital, and yet requiring some attention, can be kept for a day or two, thus possibly avoiding serious illness. Near to this same one is a labor battalion, many of the men from whom are outpatients, whose medical inspection is held at the rest station. Near another is a large convalescent camp, the O.C. of which looks to the V.A.D.s of the rest station for help in various ways. At them all there is always the work of feeding the stretcher-bearers and the ambulance-drivers, who in times of pressure have to spend many hours at their work of unloading the trains without any chance of getting a regular meal. In the early days of the rest stations, when the ambulance trains were often merely improvised, food and dressings had to be provided for all the wounded on board, but now, when the work of the British Red Cross is as near perfection as any human organization well can be, the men have every care taken of them on the perfectly fitted trains. Yet there is much attention given to the sick and wounded of every nation who come in on the trains, attention chiefly consisting of the giving of extra comforts, cocoa, lemons, shirts, slippers, cigarettes, cushions, and the redressing of wounds, while a great deal as well as feeding them is done for the staffs of the trains, for whom, besides the lending library, an exchange of gramophone records and of laundry has been arranged. Perhaps one of the most interesting things to note about the rest stations is that they are one of the few points of contact between the members of the BEF and the French population. Our camps, our hospitals, our motor convoys, are all little Englands in themselves, but every morning to the sick parade of these rest stations come not only the local VADs, the ambulance drivers, but the French civilian population as well, and in greater and greater numbers. Accidents are brought to a rest station very often in preference to being taken anywhere else, and anxious mothers bring Jean or Marie when a mysterious ailment shows itself in untoward spot or sneeze. The Gaelic cock is more than a decoration as he strides across the pottery of the rest stations. He has become a symbol as well. Chapter 6 Wax, Rumors and Realities When I spoke at HQ of the depression I found in all the landscape around, and of its peculiar morbid quality, Nearly every one assured me that I should find the country round E, whither I was going, far more depressing. There is nothing but sand dunes and huts, miles of huts, hospitals and camps, and so on. It did not sound very delightful. But to differing vision, differing effects, and personally, I loved E, terrible as cities of huts generally are, here they seemed to me to have lost much of their terror. I loved the long rippling lines of dunes the decoration of hundreds of tall pines that came partly against the sandy parlor, partly against the vivid steely blue of the river beyond. I loved the bare woods we passed all along the road, the trees still not perceptibly misted with buds, but giving, with their myriads of fine massed twigs, an effect of clouded wine color. And was there ever such a countryside for magpies? Superstition dies before their numbers, helpless to count them. So far are they beyond the range of sorrow, mirth, marriage, and birth, at one glance. Everywhere through those whiny woods there went up the fan-like flutter of black and white, the only positive notes in all the delicate universe, compact of pearly skies, 
dim purples of earth, and pale iridation of the sun. On the roads there was the usual melody of the races of the world, added to as we neared E by Canadian nurses in streaming white veils and uniforms of brilliant blue, and also, for surely the most delightful of creative blessings may rank as a race of the world, by the glossy golden war dogs, who also have their training camp near here, and take their walks abroad, waving their plumy tails and jumping up on their masters like any leisured dog at home. But, to my sorrow, I was not sent to look at the war dogs, and so had to pass by and leave the wagging plumes behind. I had several ends in view at E. I had to see the large whack camp there, its outflung ramifications, and the work that the wax did in the men's camp, and I had to see the VAD motor convoy, at which I was to spend a night. Incidentally, I had high hopes of getting permission to go out in an ambulance with the latter, though it is against the most sacred army orders for anyone not in uniform to be seen upon an ambulance. Here I may say that the permission was granted by a powerful individual known as the DDMS, though he mentioned that being shot at dawn was the least painful thing that ought to happen to me for doing it. I was to go first to the WAC headquarters, to see the area controller, who corresponds to an area commandant, in the VADs, and whose rank approximates that of a major. She is supreme in her area, and only the chief controller of the WAX is above her. Below her are her unit administrators, who are in charge of units, and approximate to captains, and have their deputy and assistant administrators, whom for convenience sake we can classify as lieutenants and second lieutenants. This is the place to say frankly that I had heard, as had we all, the rumors that were flying round about the women's army. They weren't a success, it had been found to be unworkable, and, as reason, a more specific charge. Need I say what that specific charge was? What is it that always jumps to the mind of the average materialist, the most innocent thing in the world, in itself, and the cause of most of the scandal of civilization? A baby. There is a certain type of mind which always jumps to babies, apparently looking on them as the churchmen of the Middle Ages looked on women, as the crowning touch of evil in an evil world. If you remember, there was great agitation in certain quarters at the beginning of the war, over war babies. They were going to inundate the country, they were going to be a very serious proposition indeed. The Irish question, conscription, conscientious objectors, were going to be as nothing to the matter of the war babies. It is perhaps for some points of view a pity that the war babies didn't materialize, but that, of course, is another question altogether. Passions ultra, as the great master of delicate and indelicate situations used to say. The point, as regards the women's army, is that the whole of the agitation against it is a libel, and one which decent people should be ashamed to circulate, even as supposititious. Quite apart from the evidence of my own ears and eyes, at various camps I was supplied with the official statistics for the women's army from March of 1917 to February of 1918. And of those women who have not been a success, as the mischievous gossip has it, how many do you think have proved failures out of 6,000? In the time mentioned, 14 have been sent home for incompetence, without any slur on their characters, 23 for lack of discipline, mostly in the early days, when the girls did not realize what being in the army meant, and thought if they wanted to go to any particular place there was no reason why they shouldn't and fifteen who were already incienti before leaving England, and which even the most censorious can hardly lay to the charge of the VEF. And of all that six thousand, what percentage do you suppose has had to be sent back for what is euphemistically known, I believe, as getting into trouble since landing in France? No percentage at all, if I may express myself thus unmathematically, but exactly five cases. Five out of six thousand. Compare that with the morality of any village in England, or anywhere else in the world, and then say, if you dare to be so obviously dishonest, that there is any reason why the women's army should be aspersed. These statistics were given to me at the office of the area controller, and later repeated at the women's army HQ by the controller-in-chief. But on that first sunny morning, amongst the pines and pale golden sand dunes, it was naturally the human and individual side rather than any of figures, however startling, that claimed the mind the most. For one thing, I had the actual organization and attributes of the women's army to learn. I knew nothing. 
the actual working knowledge, apart from impressions and things learnt only by seeing them, that I gathered during the days I spent at various WAC centres is as follows. The Women's Army differs from the FANY and the VAD in being a paid instead of a volunteer body, in being directly under the Army, not the Red Cross, and in its members being ranked as privates. But it also differs from the GSVAD, though that too is paid and its members rank as privates. The GSVAD is far more mixed. Its members are of all classes and educations, and are drafted off for work accordingly. But the bulk of the wax are working girls, and do manual labor, such as gardening, cooking, baking, scrubbing, etc. Though there are amongst them girls of a more specialized education, who are signalers and clerks. The officers, of course, are women of education who have undergone a stiff training, and have been carefully selected for the post they fill. For, as will be seen, nearly everything depends upon whack officers. They have certainly a greater power for good or harm than the officers of the regular army, and never were both the force and danger of personality more acutely illustrated than in the position of the WAC leaders. A unit administrator has to know individually every girl in her camp, though there may be several hundreds. She has to blend with her absolute authority a maternal interest and supervision. While she has no power to say whom a girl shall or shall not walk out with, yet she makes it her business to know what choice of men friends the girl makes, and to influence, as far as she can, that choice towards discretion. She must not nag, but must inculcate by subtle methods a realization of what is due to the uniform, a sense of the idea, the symbol of it. She does not actually say to a girl that she is not to walk arm in arm with a tommy, or pin her collar with her paste brooch, but she conveys to her that these things are not done in the best uniforms, and the girl learns with incredible rapidity. A thing is not done, what a potency in those words, in that attitude of mind. It probably influenced the earliest savages in the manner of wearing their cowries. After all, the whole idea of uniform, of distinguishing one caste from another by bits of different colored cloth, is based on the instinct for being superior. Was it not John Selden who said something to the effect that our rulers have always tried to make themselves as different from us as possible? Of course they have, and it is exactly the same thing which the wise Pope Gregory the Seventh had in mind when he definitely crystallized the measures for celibacy of the priesthood, and it is exactly the same thing which puts the policeman into a dark blue uniform and a helmet before he can so much as stop a milk cart. A policeman in plain clothes is a dethroned monarch. Nothing in the nature of controlling others was ever done without dressing up. The marvel is that for so many centuries the principle should have been confined to the masculine sex when it had such an obvious appeal to the feminine. This principle, when carried a step further and applied to those controlled, by giving them the sensation of being different from the rest of the world, results in that spirit called esprit de corps, which is really the esprit de la uniforme. Towards the rest of the world the uniformed are proud of being different, amongst themselves proud of being alike, and the more alike, so to speak, the aliker. It is not a thing to treat scornfully, for it has the whole symbolism behind it. That which makes a man cheerfully die for a piece of bunting which, prosaically speaking, is only a piece of bunting that happens to be dyed red, white, and blue, is part of this same spirit. Dull of soul, indeed, must he be who can look without a profound emotion on the tattered colors of a regiment, and yet it is only the idea, the symbol, that makes these things what they are. And for most of these girls, remember, it is the first time they have had a symbol held before them. We of the upper classes are brought up with many reverences, for our superiors, our elders, for traditions, but the classes which, for want of a better word, I must call lower, so please do not cavil at me for doing so, or attribute false meanings, are for the most part brought up to think themselves as good as anyone else, and their rights the chief thing in life, while owing to the unfortunate curriculum of our board schools, which does not insist nearly enough on history as the fount of the present, and of all that is great and good in the past, they are left without those standards of impersonal enthusiasms and imaginative daring which should be the rightful inheritance of us all. These girls are now given an abstract idea to live up to, no mere standard of expediency, but an idea that appeals to the imagination. And how magnificently they are responding, those statistics show. But more still does the attitude of all the officers and men who have to do with them. 
I talked with all ranks on the subject, and never once did I meet with anything but admiration and enthusiasm. The men are touchingly grateful to them, and value their work and their companionship, for, very wisely, the girls are encouraged to be friends with the men, are allowed to walk out with them, to give teas and dances for them in the YWCA huts, and to go to return parties given by the men in the YMCA huts. It is, of course, easy to sneer at the ideal which is held before the men, of treating these girls as they would their sisters, but the fact remains that they very beautifully do so. Another point to be remembered is, that, far from these girls being exposed to undue temptation, the great majority of them have never been so well looked after as now. They are mostly girls of a class that knows few restrictions, who, with the exception of those previously in domestic service, have always had what they call their evenings, when they roamed the streets or went to the cinemas with their boys. Now every whack has to be in by eight, can go nowhere without permission, is carefully though unostentatiously shepherded, and is provided with healthy recreation, such as Swedish exercises, Morris dancing, hockey, and the like. In short, she is now looked after and guarded as young girls of the educated classes are normally. And these are the girls, good, honest, hard-working creatures, who have been maligned in whispers and giggles up and down the country. It is perhaps needless to say that they are naturally very indignant over it, and that parents of many write to them agitatedly to demand if it's all true, and to beg them to come back, and that sometimes, when they are home on leave, instead of their uniforms bringing them the respect and honor they deserve, and which every man overseas accords to them, they are subjected to insult from people who have nothing better to do than to betray to the world the pitiable condition of their own nasty minds. End of chapter 6